Good evening, everybody. Um, we don't need a microphone for this many people, but at the suggestion of one of our parishioners, we are recording this session tonight, and it's going to be published eventually to our YouTube channel. So for those who weren't able to be here, you can direct them to, uh, to that to watch it. One of the uh, couples who has been, they've been members of St. Jude for a long, long time. Um, the wife spends a lot of time taking care of caring for her husband. She came up to me after mass on the weekend and she said, do you think, uh, I can't come Tuesday night. I really want to be there, but is there any way by any chance you can record it? I said, well, I'll ask. So thanks to our guys in the back who offered, offered to be here. They're recording us tonight. So we're going to uh, begin momentarily. Um, I'm going to say up front, I've never done this little talk before, so it's new for all of us. I have to tell you, though, I was, I was laughing just now because uh, you should have three handouts tonight. Uh, the first is white back and front, kind of a lime green back and front, and then a yellow brochure. I was laughing because the yellow brochure is how to know when to call a priest, right, for a priest. And, of course, what happens right before I come down to church? Somebody calls for a priest. So I'm like, well, I'll get back to you after, you know, so... But anyway, uh, the green sheet is a resource from what is commonly called the USCCB, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And then the white sheet is basically what we're gonna cover tonight. So what I'd like to suggest we do is uh, we'll begin and end obviously with prayer. You can remain seated. And after we pray, I'll give you my thoughts about what this night could be for us. Is that okay? All right, thank you for coming. The prayer that I would like to use uh, tonight at the beginning and the end is one with which some of you are familiar. It is one of my favorite prayers. Um, it was written by Cardinal Newman, and I think one of the things you're going to find as you, you hear the words, if you've never heard them, it was written in the 1800s. But when you hear the words, it was as if they were written for today's pace of life. It's called Peace at the Last. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Maybe we could take just a moment in silence to rest in God's presence and give thanks for this day. May the Lord support us all the day long till the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, in his mercy, may God give us safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Complete thy work, O Lord, and as thou hast loved me from the beginning, so make me to love thee until the end. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me thank you again for taking the time to be here tonight. I'd like to begin by just a quick thought about why we're offering this. We're going to be having a fall series, adult ed series, covering different topics, one of which is going to be simply informational and practical, and it may sound strange, but we're gonna offer an evening on the basics of planning a funeral. And there are two reasons we're going to offer that. One is a lot of people have asked for it. And, and it may sound, again, it may sound crazy, um, but it's kind of good to know because for most people, when the moment comes, they don't know what to do. I know when my dad passed in 2001, had it not been for my brother-in-law's dad who died a few months before that, we would not have, even as a priest, as far as the liturgy goes, I was fine. But in terms of everything else, all the pieces that come into play, I, we would have been lost. The other reason too is uh, people get to a point in their life to where they wanna kinda have that planning at least some thought done about it. Uh, in 2004, uh, when I had my surgery, by the way, I went for an oncology checkup yesterday. It's been, I told my doctor, it's been 12 years. He goes, no, you did the bath wrong. It's been 13 years. And got a great bill of health. He said, everything is perfect. But one of the things I did before surgery, because my doctor told me to my face, you could die. 
from the surgery. I went out to Father Jerry Young's house in the country, some of you know Father Young, and I did all the paperwork I needed to do, and I planned my funeral. And what I mean by that is I chose the scriptures, I chose the music, I chose who what I, I would ask to do what. And it was in no way a sad or depressing thing. It was very therapeutic in a way. So in the fall, we're gonna uh, do a little workshop on the basics, you know, what is the connection between the church office, the funeral home, and planning the liturgy, and, and how all that works, okay? So that's, that's for then. Tonight, um, we're not going to be getting into so much church teaching about this or that. We're gonna focus on the symbols that are used in the Catholic funeral rite, and how they serve to express what we believe. And I'd like to begin with the words of a really good friend of mine who's a few years older than me, who is quite fond of saying the following. Catholic ritual, when done well, nothing can beat it. And I want you to know that that's not an arrogant statement at all, but Catholic ritual, when done well, is amazing. Whether it's baptism, the sacrament of reconciliation, anointing of the sick, marriage, Eucharist, of course, you name it, and the funeral rite. When done well, it is an amazing expression of what we believe, okay? So tonight we're gonna to be talking about what is called the Catholic funeral rite. This is the text that we basically use. It's called the Order of Christian Funerals. And at the bottom, a few years ago, they had the addition with the cremation rite, because nowadays, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but more and more people choose cremation as an option. And I will answer that one theological question. Yes, you can do that. Um, but more and more people are doing it, so that was added not too many years ago. But the order of Christian funerals are what is called the Catholic funeral rite. It has many different formats. Uh, for example, this morning uh, we celebrated the funeral of our second oldest parishioner, um, and it was within the context of Eucharist, within the context of Mass. Just like marriage, there are two forms of marriage, the rite of marriage within Mass and the rite of marriage outside of Mass, which normally takes place when you have a Catholic marrying a non-Catholic. You know. It's not required, but it's, it's kind of one that they often choose. So when it comes to the funeral rite, there are different formats. Let me just mention a couple. Um, you have the full funeral rite or the mass of Christian burial, okay, which includes um, Eucharist, celebrating Eucharist together, obviously, uh, and the blessing of the body and whatnot. And then at the end of the funeral mass, it includes what is called the final commendation and farewell where you either recite or you sing. We sing in here, Beth does it wonderfully. Uh, saints of God come to their aid and so on. Um, that's one format. Another format is a funeral that's gonna take place here on Saturday. Deacon Kurt has made himself available to celebrate that funeral because I'm not available. Um, that is just a, a Catholic funeral memorial service. Uh, it can be worded different ways, but basically it's the, the Catholic funeral rite without Eucharist, without Mass. So you would celebrate and the ritual would, would march right up to the offertory in preparation of the gifts and, and you would not have that. In other words, right after the, the homily and the prayers of the faithful, uh, the deacon would come to the center and do the final commendation and farewell there. That's another format. Uh, another format would be if a person or a family opted to not celebrate a funeral in a church, but were more comfortable with a simple graveside service or a memorial service at a funeral home. In the Diocese of Baton Rouge, unlike the Archdiocese of New Orleans, we are not allowed to celebrate the funeral mass at the funeral home. If there's going to be a mass involved, um, it needs to be done at one's church. However, you can have a memorial service at the funeral home, and sometimes families will opt for just a simple graveside service. When would they do that? Think about that for a moment. What could be a possible situation in which a family, a couple, an individual may ask just for a simple yet beautiful uh, graveside service? And, and a really common situation in which that happens is if it's the loss of an infant. Not always, but many times uh, when one is just simply not up to uh, the emotional challenge that would come with being with so many people on that day. One of the first things I was asked to do when I got here was just that. Someone had given birth to their first child and um, he passed away and we did everything at the graveside. 
So there are various formats to the Catholic funeral rite. I could read from the book, I could read from the handouts uh, to state for all of us what the goal is, what we try to serve through the rite, but I was thinking about this all day today. When we celebrate someone's passing within the context of our ritual, the rite itself, it serves to do the following, three things, to comfort, to celebrate, and to assure, okay? Comfort, celebrate, and assure. It is our hope that everything that is connected to and involved with one's passing and the celebration of that life here in the faith community will in some way give at least a little bit of comfort to the one who has lost someone, at least just a little bit. Some situations are more difficult than others perhaps, but when you lose someone you love, to have people surrounding you comforting you as with kind of like a blanket of love. Uh, that's the first uh, element that we, we seek to, to, to hope, hope that happens. That's our goal. We serve to comfort. Celebrate. Um, you want to celebrate the person's life, whether they lived um, only a few days, a few moments, or many, many years, as in this morning, Miss D'Agostino lived 100 years and seven months. Yeah, it's quite a celebration. Um, so you want to celebrate their life. And what I mean by that is it is appropriate within the context of the ritual, the rite, to talk about the person's life. What made them unique? Uh, what did they bring to other people? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, for example, we really, really did that when Father Mike passed. How many of you here, just, just by a show of hands, were able to be at Mike's funeral? Some of y'all. So you noticed that we had the rite, the Catholic rite, but we had extra things going on there, right? First of all, when you walk in, there are all these symbols of his life in Ireland and whatnot, okay? Um, and then you have the camaraderie or the fraternity of priests and deacons being there and the bishop being there as well. So you really celebrate the unique nature of someone's life. Um, that is the distinction between a homily and a eulogy. The homily is to speak to the mystery of death and resurrection. The eulogy, if one is given, is more personal. It's kind of a, a recounting of the person's life. Now, nine times out of 10, uh, there is no eulogy at the funeral. So I typically sit down with every family a day or two before, and I ask them, what are you most thankful for about this person's life? And how does the way in which your mom, your dad live their life challenge us? That's the context in which we discuss it because we wanna make it as personal as possible. Um, but that's the distinction between a homily and a eulogy. So, for example, when the Catholic commentator had this big article and they put the homily that I gave at Mike's funeral in there, Father Nelson eulogizes Father Collins. I didn't really. It wasn't a eulogy. It had eulogy elements to it. But that's, that's the distinction. And typically here, if there is a eulogy, it happens um, after communion. Um, so real quickly, comfort, celebrate, and to assure the most important thing that we try to impart to one another in the Catholic funeral rite is the assurance of eternal life. That just as we said this past weekend with the story of Lazarus, death is not a permanent ending. Things are different, life on earth ends, but we are resurrected to new life with Christ forever. We comfort, we celebrate, but we, we are about assuring one another uh, of that which we do not see but believe, okay? So that's just a few words of introduction. Tonight is about the symbols that we use during the rite, and again, how they express what we believe and help us to comfort one another, like color, light, water, incense, and so on. And those personal touches, like most of the time, if you walk into a funeral here at St. Jude, either in the lobby or to the side, the family will have placed several photographs and not only photographs, but other unique reminders of the person's life. For example, I was really touched this morning at Miss Rigor D'Agostino's funeral. I think she was born in 1913, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and right before I was about to, Beth was getting ready to start the first song, I noticed on the table in the lobby, along with all the photographs, apparently in 1933, Okay, she was asked to give the commencement address at her graduation. 
I'm pretty sure it was from college. And on the table, on a little easel, was the actual address that she wrote. Typed it out on a manual typewriter in that less than 12 point print, you know, you could barely read it. Um, and I just like didn't want to touch it because it looked so fragile. And I opened it to the first page and do you know that the very first paragraph that she wrote and spoke in 1933, just in, in, a, in a really condensed form, in a poetic form, she quoted the poet Longfellow, really summarized what we believe about life and death. Just call that coincidence or call it a gift. But basically it said, all the money in the world, all the pictures we hang on the wall, all the things we purchase cannot replace the relationships that we form in life. That's what it said, that's what the poet wrote. And so part of the funeral ritual says, the bonds that we forge in life do not come unraveled with death. That's a beautiful image. So anyway, along with the, the traditional symbols and items that we use, um, you have the personal touches. So let me set the context real quickly for tonight and then tell you how I'm gonna recommend we go through this. Um, the color for the Catholic funeral ritual, regardless of where and what format it takes place in, whether it's here, at the cemetery or wherever. The color of the day, if you will, is white. So the priest wears white, um, and white is used at other times during the year. And I ask you to think for just a moment. Why do you think the color is white at a funeral? And what are some other times in the year when we would wear white or decorate the church in white? Like right now, the altar cloth is purple because it's Lent, okay? Um, but like when I talk to the kids about the, from school about the colors of the liturgical year, especially the little ones, we'll go through the year and I'll go, okay, what color do you think we wear at church for Christmas? And what do you think they all say? They say red, and they say red because of who? Santa, you know? Uh, but we wear white. We wear white on any celebration of new life. So Christmas, new life, the birth of Jesus Christ. Easter, new life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection from the dead. Uh, baptism new life into the church, new life in Christ, uh, sacrament of marriage, new life in marriage, and then, of course, uh, funerals. And other celebrations during the year, other feast days and memorials and so on, Christmas and Easter, uh, Immaculate Conception, the Feast of the Assumption, and so on and so forth. So that's the context. Everything we do in the ritual conveys new life, and it begins with the color. The best way to explain the symbolism behind the Catholic funeral rite, and you may want to follow along on the white sheet I gave you, is just to literally walk through the rite, okay? And I'm going to mention this to the guys who are in, in the booth back there recording. I'm going to step back up the steps here, Dave, so. So the funeral rite begins with the blessing of the body, which typically is placed right here lengthways if there is a body and a casket. Oftentimes, if the person uh, chose to be cremated, we'll have a table that size or a little bigger, and the remains will be placed on the table in whatever type of container the family brings, covered with a white cloth and a candle burning next to it. But either way, you begin with the blessing of the body or the remains, okay? So like for Father Mike, for example, we didn't have that. So it was simply a memorial mass because Father Mike's body was donated to, to science. But the rite begins with the blessing of the body. Typically here we begin by asking everybody to welcome each other, to comfort each other in a moment with a, a sign of peace at the beginning. And then these are the words that are spoken. And the body is blessed with holy water. In the waters of baptism, John, our brother, died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory and peace. And then the priest or the deacon blesses the body with water. So I don't know if you've ever wondered what we call this, right? It, you know, the common expression is just the holy water sprinkler, okay? Uh, so typically, when you're blessing people with holy water, uh, you have a couple of options. Uh, often at Easter, we will go outside on, on the day of Easter, Holy Saturday, and we'll clip some really nice green fern branches dip those in the water and bless people with those. Uh, but most of the times throughout the years, uh, we use this. If I wanna refer you to the, uh, the white, two-sided white handout, which I do not have a copy of. I'm gonna, thank you, Kurt. The 
The technical name for this, which I never use, is aspergillum. It comes from the Latin, the verb, which means to sprinkle, okay? So that's what this is called. Let me give this back to you, Kurt. Thanks. Um, and again, as we go through explaining the symbolism, I'm also gonna be a little practical, and I'll do like when we talk with the kids from school or RCIA. All of this has to come from somewhere, right? So there are different catalogs and companies that sell these items. So in the old days, <laughs> the old days, we used to pull out the book and make a phone call and order something. Now we just go online and that's how we order everything. Altar wine, altar bread, candles, oil for the candles, and you name it. And items like this, okay? And so typically this unscrews and it fills with holy water. I just thought this might be neat to show you all these kinds of things. So the rite begins with the blessing of the body with holy water. It is a reminder of baptism and it is a reminder of that particular person's commitment to Christ, okay? And then the celebrant, the priest or the deacon steps back. Typically here at St. Jude in most churches, funeral directors will be off to the side and we just have to motion. They come over and they will take this white cloth, which on your form is called the funeral pall, okay? And we often invite the family over. This is a very, very large cloth. I'm not gonna unfold it because it would take forever to fold it up again. And we ask the family with the funeral director helping them to clothe the casket with this cloth, which is called a pall. Now, uh, when we're doing that, there is no prayer in the text to go along with it. So typically, I like to say something like this, like this morning. Again, this is not in the text. A hundred years ago, on the day of her baptism, Miss Rieger D'Agostino was brought to church by her mother, her father, for baptism. She was clothed in a white gown a hundred years ago. Today, her family clothes her body with this cloth. It is a reminder of her baptism, the day she took on Christ. It is a reminder of her daily commitment to Jesus. And I also like to add this. This is kind of a grandmother image for me. It is a reminder of God's, the blanket of God's love into which she is now held forever, in which she is now held forever, okay? And folded and held forever. And so this is the funeral pall. It also is white. Again, these items are ordered online. We have a funeral, that is not our funeral vestment typically. Uh, we keep it in the other sacristy. It has a symbol on it, a cross, and that same symbol is on the pall. And so, uh, not that it needs to match, but when the celebrant is standing here, you see the same image on the vestments and on uh, the pall itself. Vatican II in the 1960s brought about a lot of renewal in, a, in, in the life of the church, period, but in liturgy uniquely. And so, for example, the, the pall, as I think is written in your handout, prior to, to then, would not have been white. What color would it have been? Would have been black. Vestments would have been black, I think, at one point. See, I, this all was before I, you know, became old. This was before my time. Uh, at one point, purple. Again, the darker colors, it was called a mort cloth, M-O-R-T. The darker colors uh, were more, focused more on, on the dying, the death. Okay? And so the renewal in, in liturgy called us more to focus on new life, so we switched to white. I will say this, I may have this wrong, but I think at the Abbey in Covington, St. Joseph's Abbey, the Benedictine brothers, um, at some point when a brother makes his profession, I'm not sure if it's his final profession or at what stage, but at some point in his life, in his formation, in the ceremony, He'll lay down on the altar and he will be covered with a cloth. I believe it's still a black one. And there are some prayers that are offered and songs that are sung and then they remove that and he rises anew, having fully professed himself as a, a brother in the order, okay? So there's similarities wherever you look. So we begin with the blessing of the body, the clothing of the pall, and then we sit, and then the, the rite or the mass continues as normal, the liturgy of the word, uh, just like on Sunday, uh, Old Testament, psalm response, usually sung, uh, New Testament, gospel reading, uh, the homily, 
okay? Our intercessory prayers are prayers of the faithful. Um, the gifts are then presented for Eucharist, all of which are typically done, as you all know, I'm sure, by family members or friends. Again, the goal of trying to help everyone who has lost someone feel as connected as possible, give them that opportunity for closure. That's what this does, especially when the family has the opportunity to clothe their grandmother's body or so-and-so's body with the paw, with the cloth. It's, it's a sign of farewell. Okay, it's a symbol of farewell and closure. And so that's why we invite them to involve family and friends in the liturgy as much as possible to help make it as personal as it can be. And um, then we come to uh, communion and we get to the end of the funeral mass and then we have what is called the final commendation and farewell, okay? And typically here at St. Jude, we're blessed in that Beth sings it and when she sings it, it is, it's beautiful. Um, she sings the words, saints of God, come to his or her aid, hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. And the refrain is, receive her soul and present her to God the most high. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. We sing the refrain again. And then it concludes, eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. And we sing one more time. And then there's a final, um, final prayer. Now, during that singing of that prayer, okay, uh, receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. During the singing of that prayer, what you have the opportunity to do if you're able in your church and what you're encouraged to do if you're able is to use incense. Now, as of now, here we do not. And the simple reason we have it is because typically it's been difficult to have regular people to be present to set up and serve at the funeral mass. However, um, I had a conversation with our Knights of Columbus and they are going to be taking on this new ministry where they will be, it'll be a funeral ministry. They'll help to set up, they'll help to serve, and that'll also give us the opportunity at the end of the funeral, whether it's a mass or a memorial, to use incense, okay? And before I tell, say a little bit about how we do that and why, let me just show you what we use. I know you're all familiar with this, okay? Again, people typically refer to this as the sensor, sensor but it's a thurible, okay? They come in different uh, types and styles. I'm sure you've all seen the ones growing up that had like the four or five change and you have to pull it up to open it and make that, you're laughing, so you know what I'm talking about. Had that clankety, clankety sound and whatnot, okay? Um, but this is ours. This is the one that was here when I got here seven years ago. Uh, it's very easy to pour the incense in and so on, okay? So that's what this is called. And again, um, just hundreds of different styles that you can order and purchase online. Uh, there are two at the cathedral that Bishop Munch, when he first got here, had commissioned by an artist who actually made them. He designed them and the artist made them. Again, on the practical side of the presentation, you have to have incense and you have to have something to burn it, right? So typically incense comes in a can like this. Open it up, it smells pretty good, okay? Uh, and typically incense coals come in a box like this. Looks just like that, okay? They light very easily. And so, again, this is probably the boring part for y'all, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe while we're distributing communion during the funeral mass, someone would go to the back, light the coals, and have the, the thurible uh, ready to go, okay? So why do we do that? Well, it's beautiful. Um, I know that some people don't deal well with incense in terms of allergies, and that's, that's a legitimate thing for some people. But if you can do it, it is such a powerful, powerful symbol. And we do it for basically two reasons. Uh, if you read in the, in the funeral rite itself, and I believe I included it in your handout, it gives reverence to the body as a vessel that was once a vessel of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, our body, once we pass, is a shell, or as Paul says in scripture, a tent. And he uses the image of our passing as when our tent is folded up, so to speak. 
So we reverence the body as a vessel that once was a home, a house, a temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? We also do it um, to remind us that our prayers rise, as the scriptures and the music say in many different places, our prayers rise like incense and our prayers are heard, okay? So that would occur at the very end and then the, the rite, the mass, the memorial, whatever the format is, would conclude, okay? And then we would process out, okay? Um, at the cemetery, um, whether it's a graveside or a mausoleum, um, again, it's simple but beautiful. Um, one of the things that it's very convenient to have something like this because you can take it with you very easily, if that makes sense, you know. Um, because at the graveside or at the, the tomb, the mausoleum, uh, the first thing that happens is uh, the blessing of the grave with holy water and prayers that we say over the tomb and prayers for one another. And um, that's called the rite of committal, okay? So I think uh, that's pretty much... Um, those are the basic elements. I say what I'm not going to say is the most important element, but one of the most significant elements um, for, for the end, and that is the element of the candle, okay? Commonly called the Paschal candle, uh, also at times called the Easter candle. Um, I know most of you probably know this, um, but it's blessed and lit every year for the first time that year on Holy Saturday night, uh, outside typically in most churches, um, from the new Easter fire. Uh, again, just by show of hands, how many of you have ever been to the Easter vigil? Okay, people tend to shy away from it because they go, oh God, it's gonna be four hours long. It's not, and it's beautiful. It's, it's a total celebration of the transition from death to life. <clears throat> and we begin outside, we light a new fire, we bless the fire, we light that candle uh, from the fire. Um, every year, when we're preparing for Easter, which we do almost like right after Christmas, um, you can ask the ladies in our office, we order the thing we need for Holy Week, like the little congregational candles for Easter Saturday night. We wanna make sure we have enough coals and incense and so on. And we always order a new Easter candle, okay? And so our new candle is in a box packed tightly and padded very well, because it's very fragile, upstairs uh, in the office next to Peggy's office, and we'll bring it down on Holy Saturday, okay? Um, just a little bit about these. Um, you can get an Easter candle that is hollow and burns candle oil, therefore it never burns down. Um, I think the understanding of the liturgy, it's appropriate, and it, I'm gonna say yes, yeah, my preference, that we use a real candle, so that's a real, beeswax candle, and I know that this is not necessarily on your mind, but typically they're, they're a few hundred dollars, you know. Um, so this candle is always lit during the Catholic funeral rite, again, regardless of the format. Um, it reminds us of Christ's victory over death. Very simple. It's also lit at other times during the year. So just think for a moment, based on your, uh, your upbringing and your celebration of life as a Catholic, when we light this candle during the year. Um, we light it at baptisms. And so when uh, the mom and dad and godparents are given their baptism candle, ideally it would be lit from this. Now sometimes if we're unable to use this, um, we'll light a smaller candle. But typically, again, new life in Christ in baptism. Uh, also um, during the Easter season, it's burned at every mass, okay? And then there are other, uh, so those two occasions and, and the funeral rite, um, that, that's ordinary, you do that. There are other occasions, celebrations during the year when you can use it if you'd like. For example, uh, I have had couples on their wedding day ask to have it lit and burning um, at their wedding mass, their wedding, which you can certainly do, okay? So I just wanted to uh, kind of conclude with, it's a very powerful symbol. If you come to the Easter vigil, Holy Saturday night, the church is in darkness and we carry this candle in and for a good part of the way, 
that is the only light that is lit. And from it, we light the candles that everyone else is holding in church. And we try to do it without getting wax on the pews, just saying. <laughs> so anyway, that's just kind of an overview of the rite and some of its symbolism. Um, I'll stop right there and ask if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts, or did you learn something you didn't know before tonight or anything at all? Yes, thank you. I should have mentioned that. Uh, like for cremation? Yes. So um, for cremation, uh, the rite of uh, Christian burial with uh, cremated remains, okay? There is a white cloth about four by four. We, use, we have it in the back. Also, believe it or not now, funeral homes now have that uh, on site. And so it's the same thing, but obviously smaller because there's no body. But yeah, you do clothe the urn or whatever the remains are in, you clothe that with a white cloth as well for the same reason. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, like you what? I'm a hey, there you go. Yeah, so ideally, uh, it's, it's really common almost every single time for families to ask to have visitation here in church, and that's certainly fine. We make everything available for them. Ideally, you would place the body near the font during visitation, a reminder of baptism. It's just that people tend to congregate where the body is, so we'll do that up here. If you go to St. Aloysius, it's a lot easier there to do it that way. If there's a cremation, do the ashes? Um, let me, I don't know if they heard. His question is basically what happens to the ashes if it's a funeral with cremation? What happens to the ashes after the funeral? Do you take them directly to the place of burial or not? It all depends on what the family wants to do. When there's cremation, part of my responsibility um, is to have a conversation with the family about uh, what is appropriate and what is not in terms of interring the remains wherever. Um, in many cases, uh, it'll go to the place of burial. In many cases, they'll say, we're going to keep the remains now, and then when so-and-so can come into state, then we're gonna go. Like today, for example, it's a different but similar. Um, we couldn't do the burial today. Miss D'Agostino was gonna be buried at Roselawn. And why do you think we couldn't do it? It was just soaking, soaking wet. They couldn't, so, in a few days or whenever we can get out there, we're gonna go back. That happens sometimes with cremation. Uh, and then there are some people who simply keep the remains. Uh, you can have all the conversations with them you want about, I don't use the word should, but what's appropriate and what's really symbolic and what not to do with the remains. But every now and then you will have people who simply keep their loved ones' remains. And I'm, I'm not being funny, some will have them in the house on the mantle. This is true, true story. Or uh, in, a, in a little monument in their backyard. Uh, and then maybe I know one family has a little grotto they built, you know? So it just kind of depends. Yes, sir, you had a hand up. The, what are, okay, well, you're gonna laugh. Um, we're actually missing one of these red nails. They got lost somehow, so there you go. But at the Easter Vigil, when we bless the candle, these are not in there. They come with it, and hopefully you don't lose them between when the candle arrives and Holy Saturday. And as part of the rite, you place these in here one at a time, and the prayer speaks to the wounds of Christ, and then the symbols for the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus, the beginning and the end. And this particular, let me say first, Every candle is different. Some are plain. I told James last year, you pick out the one you think it looks nice, so I think he and Peggy picked this one out. This has a little symbol of the Trinity right in the middle. So it doesn't have to have anything on it, except we will put these on it regardless, if it's a plain candle or if it has something, so. What's 
What do we do with? Oh, what do we do? Well, like, what will we do with this candle? Um, we don't do anything particular with it. Uh, we treat it with respect. We keep it in the office, and it's very common. I'll take it out and use it for retreats. Like if you're going on site for a weekend with a, a group of teenagers for a retreat, and you can bring, uh, this would be a little big to bring because it's got another foot or so to it, but I have one in my office that is about, it's burned down. That It is so neat to be able to bring that on retreat and it gives you the opportunity to do all kinds of ritual and prayer with them, correct, connected to, to baptism and reconciliation and you name it, so. Did somebody else have a hand? Yes, Sandy, hey. We know, we know that we can't have order of Christmas until we're inside of Mass at the funeral. Correct. Can you have it outside of Mass at the funeral? Yeah, in other words, I just simply refer to that as a memorial service. If you wanna have the funeral service, at the funeral home without a mass, you can do that. Correct, correct, yes. Yes. Father, I went to a, uh, a funeral and they, uh, and the priest was sick and they did have the deacon serve communion mm -hmm. at that. A communion service, right. Yeah. That's typically what it would be. Yeah, yeah I don't know if, um, I have to look and see. I, I've never had that request made of me, so I don't know if that's a can or cannot do thing in our diocese. That was in this, in this diocese. Yeah, what, what you have to understand is it's local law. It's particular to each diocese. For example, not related to funerals. Um, in the diocese of Baton Rouge, you cannot celebrate a wedding after I think it's two o'clock, three o'clock on a Saturday. But in New Orleans, you can. Um, and so again, when it comes to law connected to funerals and mass in a funeral home and not, it varies from diocese to diocese. Like in New Orleans, you, like my brother-in-law's mom had died and we did the visitation, the mass and the burial. What is the cemetery in Metairie, the big one? Lake Juan? Lake Juan, Metairie, we did everything right there, so. Anything else? Oh, wow. So we have two funeral directors here tonight. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, that helps because you think about offering something like this and you don't really know, well, will people respond to it or be interested or whatever. So thank you. I did Mr. Johnson's funeral too. I love that funeral. Let me mention this. Um, culturally, sometimes there may be um, added elements to the celebration of a funeral, as with a wedding. <laughs> culturally, that if it's appropriate, uh, there could be extra elements, extra things done. Uh, you all know Oscar Udo, okay? Real big involved here at St. Jude. Well, Oscar uh, is from Nigeria. His son, Eboro, got married, I wanna say it was back in the summer, November. I got everything mixed up. And um, I did not know they were going to do this. I don't know if anybody, were you, were you all here? You're gonna have to remind me of how this happened. I realize this is not funeral, right? But it makes a point. Literally at the end, 
the entire assembly, the entire congregation stood up and sang, and not only sang, but they marched through the whole church. And it was part of their culture, and it was beautiful. Um, and sometimes, depending on culturally, with the funeral rite, Native American Indian, which we really don't see here in South Louisiana, Hispanic culture, uh, African American, and so on. There are other elements that could be present. Okay? Yes? Just a little example about the fall session. Here's just a little example. Again, it's practical, but it's things people don't know. Um, when you get to where you're planning a funeral, I'm not gonna say the first, but probably, well, yeah. You the, call the church first, you know, because uh, it has happened at times when a family has met with a funeral home and they pick the day and they pick the time and they've done the obituary and they told all their families and friends who are coming in from wherever and then they call us and the church is not available or we're not available. So I mean, it happens. It, it, it rarely happens. It happens more with some funeral homes than others. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but anyway, that's just, a, that's just kind of the chain, the way things are connected and work out. We'll have a little brochure we give you if you come and so on. Okay. All right. How do you include that? Final commendation and farewell. Yes. So, what's your question then? Well, sometimes the body will not go for burial. Uh, sometimes it will go to be cremated, or sometimes it will, um, like today, we had to wait. So they took the body, and they're just keeping the body at the funeral home until whenever. I know at Lake Juan Metairie in New Orleans, they showed us there is a, actually a door that slides open. When everyone is left, they, you know, so, yes, you were going to Like, like, here's, the, you know, there are some, people choose cremation when they choose it for various reasons. Um, and whenever we celebrate a funeral with cremated remains, it's just as beautiful. However, I just think of some of the struggles that might come with that or realities. For example, um, right after I got here, there's a family I knew from another parish uh, in which the dad, who was a dentist in his 50s, uh, died suddenly. And his son, who I had known him and his sister since they were like little, little. At the time, his son was in his early 20s. And um, his son got up and gave the eulogy, did an outstanding job. But the dad had expressed that he had wanted to be cremated. Apparently they had talked about this along the way. And I'll just have this image in my mind, and I'm not saying this is, a, this is not a criticism or a bad thing, it's just an image that is in my mind. We did just what you said, we had the mass, it was a beautiful celebration, you couldn't even get into the church, it was so crowded. Dr. Corky Brown was his name, some of you knew Corky. And we processed out, and the hearse was parked out front of the church at Most Blessed, and the pallbearers took the casket, placed it in the hearse, closed the door, and a lot of times cremation happens before, but in this case it was gonna happen after, okay? 
and the, the hearse drove off. And Wes, who is the son, actually an actor in Hollywood, if you believe that, um, was just kind of left, he stayed there until they closed the door and he just was kind of left standing there, you know, just looking at the car driving off. And in that moment, I just kind of wondered, uh, I hoped that at some point uh, he would get the closure that he needed. So that's not a suggestion either way. This is just the reality of some of the emotions. That's why, again, everything we do is meant to convey what we believe, life over death, okay? So, all right. Well, we're, we're done. Uh, we've been here for almost an hour. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Why don't, before you go, if y'all wanna stand, we'll just we'll say a really quick prayer. Reminder, this weekend is Palm Sunday. You wanna talk about powerful symbolism, Holy Week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for this day, this special time of year. Continue to draw us more deeply into the embrace of your love, more deeply into prayer and charity for our neighbor. Help us to see and know your Son in our midst, Jesus Christ, who taught us all how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you very much.